So we're still learning what it means to walk in love, and you'll see that words walk in love come from Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. And what we want to do is we want to learn to love better. We've spoken about many reasons why one would want to love, but the one reason is that there's a verse that says kindness draw people to repentance. And so often the best way to get people to save is not to shout at them and walk around with banners saying God hates you and you're going to hell. Often that's not the best way. Kindness makes people go, what's different about you? Why do you have hope? Why do you repay kind, my evil with kindness? And then often in that kindness, we can bring people, not to us, but to God. And we're busy learning from Colossians what it means to love. Colossians, we said, have this lovely picture of what it means to become a child and then to grow into be a child. And the picture is of someone who's dead. You are dead in your sins. You are, you are not alive. You are stinking dead, away from God, enemy of God. And then God comes and He says, you can't do anything about the fact that you are dead, but I can do something about it. I can make you alive. Now the sad thing about a country like South Africa is that there are many zombies walking around. Many people who think they're alive, but they're not alive. And if you ask someone, but are you a Christian? Um, yeah, 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 no. 30 years ago I was baptized, or you know, 20 years ago I... I, I told people I love Jesus and, and he's saying, but are you alive? Do you know God? Do you walk with him? Is he the center of your existence? Then you'll go, um, no. And so the picture is here of saying you are dead, but God is willing to make you alive. But we say Colossians doesn't stop there because then it's as if you've made a person alive, but they're still wearing all their dead clothes that's now old and torn and stinking. And you're saying, you can't stay like that now that you're alive. Things have to change. You have to start by taking off the old things. Now, what are the old things? The, the, the clothes of your old self. Those are all the things that, that keep you in the world, that keeps you acting and being like a dead person. So those are sins. Those are addictions. Those are bad attitudes. Those are hurtful ways we treat other people. He's saying, put off all the bad things. Can we? Yes, we can if the Spirit lives in us. Cannot do it by ourselves, but with the power of the Spirit we can. So he's saying, put off all those bad things, but then don't walk around naked. Replace it with good things. Put on good things. Because there's an interesting thing about humans is that we cannot just let go of something bad. We cannot live with a void. So when you put something off, you have to replace it with something good, otherwise the bad comes back. So now, for instance, there's an example in the Bible that says, those who steal must stop stealing. So that's putting off. But he says, if it's just about stop stealing, you're going to steal again in a while. He says, stop stealing and now replace it with working hard so that you have money to give away. So you've, you've put off the bad, but you've put on something good to replace it with. That's God's secret about living the good Christian life. Letting go and putting on good things. So the question obviously today that we have to ask ourselves is, are you dead still? Are you still dead? I was, I'm going to speak about it this evening. I'm going to mention it, but I want to mention it here as well. In places like South Africa where Christianity is, is the norm, if you can put it that way, 79.6% people on the census said they are Christians. If you go to someone and you say, you know what, are you really a Christian? Tell me, are you really, really a Christian? You get three different responses. The first response is, yes, I love him. He's the center of my existence. Can I tell you about my God? The second response is, no, I'm not a Christian. You and your myths and your stories, go believe what you want to believe over there. I'm not a Christian. But in a place like South Africa, you have an interesting third group. When you ask them, are you really a Christian? They get very mad. How dare you insinuate that I am not a Christian? I'm thinking... Why? Why that anger about a question? It's like if someone comes to you and asks you, are you fat? Now, either way you go, yeah, I am. It's true. I need to do something about it. Or you go and you say, no, no, look at me, man. I'm fit. I exercise. I'm not fat. And the question doesn't even bother you. But if you're living in denial, you will say, how dare you call me fat? And that's a problem. Too many people 
are living in denial that they think they are Christians. And when people start scratching on that thing, they get very angry. How dare you say? So maybe that's you today. How dare you challenge me on that? All I'm saying is, do you know God? If you stand before Him one day, will He say, come my child, I know you, I lived with you, we had relationships. So yeah, once you're, once you're alive, we have to, we do have to change. And that's what we're busy on at the moment. We're looking on putting on love. That's one of the, the clothes, clothing pieces we need to put on. And he explains love and explains this whole, what we have to put on in such beautiful terms and words. And so we are going to talk today about putting on humility. Now humility again is one of those Christian characteristics that the world doesn't get. And sadly, so many Christians even fall into the world's mold of how you should live. Either because they don't know what the Bible teaches about humility, or they don't like what the Bible teaches, and they just move on. Now, I can help you with what not knowing what the Bible teaches. I can help you with that. But I can't help you with the fact that you don't like what the Bible teaches. That's between you and God. So we're going to read, you can open your Bibles to Colossians 3. We're going to read again like last week. We're only going to read today verse 12 to 14. Colossians 3 from verse 12 to 14. I'm going to ask Joel just to come and read. Joel will read it to us. Thank you, Joel. Colossians 3 from verse 12 to 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another and... If one of you has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let us pray together. Lord, how wonderful to remind ourselves that you will never command something that is impossible to do in your strength. You will never call us to do something that when we try, we will just always fail and And feel miserable about life. But in the power of your word and your spirit. You enable us to fulfill everything that you've called us to be. Lord we will still mess up. How wonderful that you are forgiving. But let us not use that as an excuse. Not to go for it with everything in our being. Leave behind the things of this world. And reach out and stretch out for you. To become more like Christ every day. And Lord as we speak today about humility. Teach us what it means and empower us to live with it. Empower us that this will be who we are. Lord, our desire is always to be people who glorify you and people who draw others in to glorify you as well. And humility is so needed before we're able to do that well. So Lord, speak to us today. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at this idea of that we are God's chosen ones, that we are holy, we are set apart, and we are beloved. And once that clicks for you, it becomes so much easier to start living the put-ons. Put on compassionate hearts. Put on kindness. That's what we looked at last week. This week we're going to look on, put on then, dot, 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 humility, meekness. Now what is humility and meekness? Humility and meekness, again, is the, the inside and the outside of the same thing. It's by and large, it's often used interchangeably, but humility has often got to do with the inside, how you feel and think and believe and dream and desire and your emotions on the inside. So who am I as a person on the inside? Am I humble on the inside? Meekness or gentleness, as the Bible use, is that humility then going out into actions. The way I treat others, do I treat them as someone who's humble? Do I treat them gently? Do I treat them with kindness? Does this humility in me bubble over into the way that I treat other people? Now we're going to do a quick test whether you struggle with humility. So now it's just between you and God and the questions. And so you have to be honest with yourself to see, is this something that I really need to work on? Because like we've said right in the beginning of this series, it's so easy to think I'm good at something until I'm challenged with God's word on what it really is And then I go, oh, I fall so far short. So the first test is this. How do you respond when you hear about load shedding? 
is your first response and your biggest response about how it affects me? Or, well, you know, there are so many businesses who can't afford a generator. What about them? That's, that's the first thing that makes me realize, oh, who's on the throne here in my heart? The second question, how do I respond when someone doesn't treat me like I think I should be treated? So I'm now the paying customer and I come to your shop and the teller there is very short with me and, and I'm like, no, this is not how I should be treated in this situation. The third question is, how do I respond when I don't get praise for something that I've done? And even worse, when someone else gets praise for something I've done. Do I go, oh, no, me. You forgot about me. The next one is, I have to word this carefully. How do you respond when your children come to you and say, Mom, Dad, we've really been thinking about it. You cannot live alone anymore. It's really wise for you to think about your future now, where you're going to live. People like me don't live in an old age home. I need my stuff. Fifth question says, how do you react when someone comes to you and says, you're doing that wrong? Let me show you how to really do it well. How dare you? Humility is close to the heart. Okay, so what is humility? The world's definition of humility is, there are a couple, but it's often things like, you go and do something that's beneath you. So humility would be to go to Malco Fontaine and, and hand out some parcels during Christmas. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. But then you go home and feel proud about everything you've done. You can't have humility and pride in the same sense. The Bible contrasts humility with words like haughty, arrogance, so being arrogantly superior and disdainful, looking down on others. So the Bible says that's the opposite of humility or pride. And the words that the Bible associate with humility is words like lowliness, the absence of pride, absence of making things about me. It's also often associated with fearing and obeying God. So having a right understanding of who I am as the creation, as the sinful one who saved by grace undeservingly before this great, magnificent and fantastic God. And it's Interesting that often humility is linked with fasting. I give up the things I want. I really want food. But I'm, I'm willing to humble myself and, 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 and give it up to focus on God and make it about Him. Now, there are a lot of things that humility is not. Humility is not self-pity. Often people think, oh, look at me, I'm so terrible and I'm the worst. Oh, that, that's not humility. It's the very interesting thing that self-pity is actually a form of pride. Why am I not getting the attention that I think I should? Come on, tell me that I'm not so bad. Self-pity is not humility. Humility is also not lacking confidence. It's not sitting there in a corner and, and not wanting to do anything because I don't have any confidence. Humility is standing in confidence based on who I am in Christ. And based on everything I can do, not because of myself, but because of Him. So, humility is also not about being inactive. Well, I won't do anything. I'll just be in the corner. No. Humility needs to flow over in meekness into gentle actions. Humility is about using your gifts because you realize it's not me. But man, what a privilege to be used by God using my gifts. So, there are a couple of verses that teach us as humility quite well. The first one is Romans 12 verse 3 that says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So it's this idea that when I get the picture, not just the picture of people I see around me and the world around me, if I get the picture of God, the gracious one, and myself as a sinner, weak, Needing Him every day. We've just saying, Lord, I need You every hour. Then if I think about myself in that sense, I start understanding what humility is. There's another lovely verse that teaches us. It's Philippians 
2 verse 3 that says, Do nothing from selfish ambition. The lack of humility is often selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Count is the word that means hold this view. Tell myself, have this belief that others are more significant than myself. C.S. Lewis said this in a very nice way. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's thinking soberly about myself. Humility is not constantly putting myself down and telling myself and others how terrible I am. It's just not thinking about myself much. And rather use my thoughts on other people and their needs and what they want. Now, that is humility. Meekness is just, the, like I said, the practical outflowing of humility. It is showing others that I don't live with pride. It's showing others that I don't make much of my own dreams and desires. It's showing others that I value them higher than myself in a practical way. Now we have great examples in the Bible about humility and meekness. Who would be the best example for us? Jesus. Easy. But we have another example in the Bible that is very helpful in understanding this. And that's the example of who's the most meek man on earth? Moses. Okay. Well done. People read their Bibles. Okay. The another example, um, Numbers 12 verse 3 tells us that Moses was the meekest man on earth, which also tells us that there was some post-editing in the five, first five of the books of the Bible. I don't think Moses wrote this line himself. Someone else came late and said, Moses, yeah, he was the most meekest man on earth. And he is a, a wonderful, helpful example to teach us about humility. Because was Moses weak? No. Was he crouching in the background, never doing anything? No. Did he do brave and courageous things? Yes. So what made him humble? What made him meek? It's the fact that he gave up his luxuries and his comforts. He was a prince. He lived in the palace of Pharaoh. He had everything his heart's desire and even more. And he was willing to rather make his focus his people, his struggling people. He walked from the palace to go and see what's going on with him, how he can help them. He gave his life to the Israelites. There's one point in the story where I think God is testing Moses. And he tells Moses, "These people, I'm sick and tired of these people, these Israelites. Let's kill all of them. And then I'll start over with you. Now imagine you Moses. And you are also up to here with these Israelites. And God offers you this idea. Let's just remove them. And I'll start new with you, a new nation. But what is Moses' response? No, God, help them. It's not about me. Help them. Let's get them there. Let's, let's work on them. The, the sad thing about Moses' example is that he gave up everything and never got it himself. He gave his life to take the Israelites to Canaan and he never went in himself. He never saw it. God says, oh, you did this thing wrong. You're going to die before you get there. So he really gave up everything about himself for others. So let's try to build a definition for humility and meekness. Humility and meekness is to change your thinking and actions in such a way that you place others and their well-being as your goal. Even if you yourself suffer loss because of it. I'm going to read it again. Humility and meekness is to change your thinking, your beliefs, your heart, and your actions in such a way that you place others and their well-being as your goal, even if you yourself suffer loss because of it. Now that definition is almost correct. There's a problem with that definition. Because it makes it sound like to be a Christian is just to be walked over, Never get anything good, and you're always the least, and then the end comes, and that was just your life as a Christian. Is that true? No, it's not true. And we see it from so many verses that says, Humble yourselves, therefore, 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. If what I told you about Moses was his full story, it would have been a very sad story. 
Someone who gives up his whole life and never gets anything in return for it. But Moses' story does not end that day he dies on the mountain. Moses entered the presence of God and this little country, Canaan, never went into his mind again. In eternity, we'll talk again. He got the better deal. He didn't have to go into Canaan and have all these fights. He got a better deal. And that is so true of us as well. We are called to make ourselves the least in this world. We are called to often give up our dreams, our desires, what we want. Because our reward is in heaven. Our reward is not here. That verse says, at the proper time. You know, at that time, might not be on this earth. It's often not on this earth. It's often only after he comes again. So let's look at a better definition. Uh, let's, let's try to fix this definition. Let me fix it by adding one word. Even if you yourself suffer temporary loss because of it, God will always repay. God will always make it right. God will always make it worth it. I want to make an important side note here because this can lead you maybe to think in the wrong direction. This type of humility and meekness by making yourself the least does not mean to be part of evil. It does not mean to allow evil to continue. In other words, if my husband beats me up, I don't stay and say, oh, I'll be the least. I leave. I go find help. If someone steals from me, I can phone the police. I can put up burglar bars. That guy is living in justice. If someone hurts my child, I call the police. I get a restraining order. I do things to protect the people that God placed in my care. But if someone hurts my ego, I take it in my stride. If someone does something to me and I go, you know what, I can live with this. It doesn't do dishonor to my family and well-being that I need to look after. It doesn't do dishonor to God in that sense. I can go with this. Then you are the least. And you make yourself the least. Jesus did. That's what he did. He was willing to become nothing. To be treated like a, a slave. To be treated like a, a, a criminal. And so, yeah. Don't say that I've said, yeah, well, I'll, I must sit and let my husband beat me up because I must be humble. No. We need to protect people as well. So in conclusion, I just want to say again that this passage is not a kind suggestion. It's not a kind suggestion. I'll be humble when you feel like it. It's a command from God. And how do you get it right? How do you get it right to really go, wow, I have to really think about other people before I think of myself? You only get it right if you consider again your standing before God. If you consider again that God treated me so kindly. God did not make it about himself, but made it about me by coming to earth as a slave. I can do it for others. My reward is in heaven. Especially if you're sitting here today, and as you're listening to this, God is placing people or certain people groups or certain family members into your mind, and you realize, I do not live with humility towards them. I do not live with meekness and gentleness towards them. What do you do? You pray your knees raw until something happens. You take your thoughts captive. We, we've heard, I can change my heart. I can change how I feel and how I think. So the moment I start thinking, oh, you are so terrible, or oh, I'm so good, I take those thoughts captive and say, that is not the thought of a child of God. And I think better thoughts about other people. And I purposefully do good things for them. I purposefully think good thoughts of them. I purposefully pray good prayers for them and not make it about me. And lastly, how do I get it right? Well, meekness is a gift of the Spirit. Which means is that we can't work it up. We can't work it hard enough to be meek. We become more meek when we walk with the Spirit. We become more meek when we are filled more with the Spirit. We become more meek when we don't make it about ourselves, but make it about God. What a, what a life it would be if these things start happening in the church. People live with gentleness. People live with humility. People, and I'm so glad that I often see it here. But I'm also sad that I often don't see it. 
And so let God change us. Let God work in us. Let's walk with the Spirit. Let's pray together. Yes, Lord, thank you for the example of Moses that teaches us to be meek. It's not to be nothing. It's not to be useless and never achieve anything in life. It's about achieving our purposes in you. It's about being an instrument in your hand for your glory and achieve great things and experience great things, great experiences of your power, as long as we don't make it about us. And so, Lord, teach us that humility. Teach us that meekness, that gentleness to really think more of others than ourselves. To really let go of this pride and this selfishness that we so often hold on to. Thank you, Lord, that meekness is a gift of the Spirit. That if we walk with you, if we live with you, if we desire and pray to be filled with the Spirit, these things will grow and you will grow it in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray that you will do that. We pray that you will. Lord, I want to pray that if there are people here that now have names on their mind that you've placed there, of people that they are not treating with gentleness and with kindness, Lord, that they will start to change in their hearts, that they will start to change in how they think about this person, how they pray for this person. Lord, as we said before, let us first pray for our heart to change before we pray for someone else to change. Lord, let us be light and salt into this world of who you are. Let us reflect your humility, your gentleness to this world. Only in your power, Lord. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.